This is lecture number three, uh, part two on the structure of complex systems. And this is uh, for IE4399, Introduction to Systems Engineering, IE5397, System Thinking and Analysis. So the material that we'll be discussing in this video it's coming from uh, Korsakoff Systems Engineering Principles and Practice, and it is located in chapter three of your textbook. And the agenda for today includes the following. Uh, we're gonna talk about the system building blocks, specifically about what we know um, on functional building blocks and physical building blocks for a system. We are also gonna discuss the system's uh, environment and also interfaces and interactions. So as I mentioned already, the system building blocks, the, is, this is split into two parts. Uh, first, the functional building blocks, which are the functional elements of the system and the physical building blocks, which are the components of the system. Uh, but before we get started, we, we have to uh, go back to what we discussed in our previous lecture. I just want you to remember about the hierarchy of complex systems, and there are six different levels, um, and they're listed here. Uh, it goes from complex systems, um, may be represented by a hierarchy structure in that they are composed of. So starting from part subcomponent, component, subsystem, system, and finally, the what we call the systems of systems, which is how your system is integrated into uh, the environment where it, it interacts with other systems. So for example, you remember the, the car, so we can go through the hierarchy, um, Talk about wires, gauges, uh, instrument panel, car interior. Uh, the car itself is the system. And then the car is gonna be interacting with other systems like garages and, and roads. So knowing the hierarchy of systems, um, we can talk about the system building blocks. And an important and generally unrecognized finding resulting from an examination of this hierarchical structure of a variety of complex system is the existence of a, an intermediate level of elements of types that recur in a variety of systems. So the components or device or the components are the signal receivers, data displays, uh, torque generators, containers, and so on. So when we look at this, uh, specifically the system building blocks, uh, we can recognize that there are an intermediate level of elements that are repeated or that they are pre present in most of systems uh, development. So if we, if we look at this table, table 3.1, uh, which discusses the system design hierarchy, we have some examples like the one that we show you uh, in the previous slide about the, for each one of the levels of the hierarchy uh, for these four different type of systems, communication system, information system, material processing systems, and an aerospace system. Examples about what will be considered a subsystem, what will be considered a component, what will be considered a subcomponent, and parts and so on. Um, so if you look at the devices, the components, we have the signal receivers, we have the data displays, we have the torque generators, and we have the containers. Um, so for functional building blocks, these are the functional elements. So there are three basic entities that con con constitute the media of which systems operate. And the, they are the information, which is the content of all knowledge and communication, material, which is the substance of all physical objects, physical objects, 
and the energy, which energizes the operation of and movement of all an active system uh, components. So if you look at any system, you will find any engineer system, you will find that they, they're, they're, they have these three pieces or these three functional blocks uh, as part of their uh, development. Okay, so they all contain some type of information. They contain some type of material or substance that makes them a physical object. And then they have some type of energy that will allow them to operate. So from this list, the information, which is number one, can be subdivided into two classes. The first ones are the elements dealing with propagating information. This could be things like the radio signals. These are called signal elements. So now that we are dealing with the uh, internet of things, this is becoming very um, relevant and is, is, is being uh, integrated to most of, of systems. Uh, so they have some type of way of connecting to the wireless, for example. And also we have the elements dealing with stationary information, like for example, computer programs. These are data elements. So if we look back at, the, at this list, we have three, three basic entities that con constitute the media of which systems operate. But if we look at the information and we split it into two, then we end up with four classes of systems uh, functional elements. The signal elements, which sense and communicate information, data elements, which interpret, organize, and manipulate information, material elements, which provide structure and transformation of material, and the energy elements that provide energy and motive power. So the selected element must be self-consistent and representative. Three criteria may be used to ensure that each element is neither trivially simple nor inordinately complex and has wide application. So first, the criteria of significance. Each functional element must perform a distinct and significant function, typically involving several elementary functions. Number two is the criteria of singularity. Each functional element should fall largely within the technical scope of a single engineering discipline. And number three is commonality. The function performed by each element can be found in a wide variety of system types. So the three criteria um, that are used to ensure that each element is neither trivially simple or not inordinately complex are significance, singularity, and commonality. Uh, so in this slide, we have the 23 functional elements um, based on each class function. So we have again, signal, data, material, and energy. And you can see that for each class, we have an elemental element function and we have an application. Uh, so for these 23 functional elements, uh, five or six are per class. So if we look at signal, we have the input signal, transmit signal, transduce uh, signal, receive signal, process signal, and output signal. And we have the application next to it. So if we look at the application for input signal, we have TV camera. For transmitting a signal, we have the uh, FM radio transmitter. To transduce the signal, radio antenna, radar antenna. Receive signal, the radio receiver, process signal, image processor, the output signal, the TV tube. For data, uh, we also have input data, process data, control system, control processing, store data, output data. If we look at a computer, we can easily connect this to uh, an application. So for input data, we have the keyboard, process data, we have the computer. Uh, the control system will be the operating system. Control processing will be, for example, a word processor. 
Stored data will be a magnetic uh, disk and the output data could be the printer. For materials, the element functions will be support material, store material, react material, form material, join material, and control position. Uh, so for support material, an airframe. Um, for store material, a shipping container. For react um, material, autoclave. Uh, to form material, a milling machine. For joining material, a welding machine. And for control position, an actuator. Finally, uh, we get to the element functions of the energy. So we have a generate truss, generate torque, generate electricity, control temperature, and control motion. Uh, some applications for generating truss, a turbo jet engine, uh, for generate torque, reciprocating engine, uh, for generating electricity, it could be a solar cell array, uh, for controlling temperature, the refrigerator, and from controlling motion, the auto transmission. Um, so what are the components for the physical building blocks? So uh, we were talking up uh, on the previous slide, which is this one, uh, slide number 10, we were talking about functional building blocks. Now we're gonna transition to physical building blocks. So these are the components. System physical building blocks are the physical embodiments of the functional elements consisting of hardware and software. Okay, so the functional, these are the functions, these are the things that these uh, building blocks are going to perform, right? But the actual building blocks is the physical embodiment of those uh, functions. Uh, so the classes into which the component building blocks have been categorized are based on the different design disciplines and technologies that they represent. So in total, 31 different component types were identified and grouped into six categories. And these are shown on the next slide in table 3.3. So, um, so for component design elements, uh, we have uh, six, six categories, electronic, electro-optical, electromechanical, mechanical, thermomechanical, and software. These are again component design elements. Uh, so for components in terms of electronic, we have receiver, transmitter, data processor, signal processor, communication processors, and special electronic equipment. Uh, in terms of functional elements, you can see the, uh, the functional elements that were listed uh, here. Um, so going back to, uh, for example, the electronic, you have this receive signal, transmit signal, process data, uh, process signal, process signal data, and various. So now you have a mixture per category. Um, um, so for electro-optical, we have different components. Uh, and, and again, you can see that the functional elements go from in signal, inputting signal, storing data, uh, forming materials and generating electricity. So you have a combination of all the uh, class functions uh, that were uh, listed here. And you can go through the whole list uh, for electromechanical, you have uh, the components, inertia instrument, electric generator, data storage device, transducer, uh, data input output device. And again, the functional elements are linked to those uh, that were uh, discussed previously. So this is important when you're starting design, uh, when, when you start thinking about the, the functions that your system must perform, uh, you think about those functions and then you wanna find out, let's say for example, um, you have certain requirements from your customer and these requirements are going to be trans, uh, translated into functions that your system must perform. So for example, do you, you can say, okay, this system, your customer can tell you this system must operate uh, under certain temperature. Okay, so that's a requirement. Uh, so how do you translate that into, into uh, your system? Well, you have to find a function. Right, a function that uh, can be linked to that requirement. 
So in this case, uh, if we look at this um, um, list, system functional elements, if you think about controlling the temperature, that's part of the energy class, right? Um, controlling temperature is one of the element functions within the energy. Um, so we have a function, right? It's controlling the temperature of uh, which is linked to that requirement from the customer. Uh, so that function now has to be translated into um, a physical embodiment. Um, so controlling a temperature, if you look at um, the category thermomechanical, you can do the, those functions by uh, looking at these components, a heating unit and a cooling unit. So now you can see the process. So you go from understanding the requirements from your customer, what are the requirements for your system? You translate that into a function. You have the functional elements and those functions can be also being linked to some type of components, uh, which are part of this list of categories, electronic, electro-optical, mechanical, thermomechanical, and so on. So I want you to keep thinking about um, why we need this. Um, and then um, this is what we, we call the system perspective. So functional elements and how do you connect? So these functional elements are gonna be tied to your customer requirements, uh, the, the, the actual requirements for your system. Uh, what, what, is, what, what is the system supposed to do when you state those requirements and then you are going to link some functions to those requirements and those functions are going to be linked to some type of components within your system. So that being said, we can talk about the system environment. Uh, which is the next topic in this uh, lecture. Uh, so the system environment may be broadly uh, defined as everything outside of the system that interacts with the system. Uh, the interaction of the system with its environment form the main substance of system requirements. So we were talking about system requirements just a few minutes ago. Um, so it is the responsibility of the systems engineer to understand these interactions, to make sure that the system requirements uh, reflect the full range of operating conditions. So what, are this, what, what is the system boundary or boundaries? These define what is inside the system and what is outside. Although defining the system boundary seems almost trivial at first glance, in practice, it is very difficult to identify what is part of the system and what is part of the environment. Uh, different organizations tend to define boundaries differently, even with similar systems. Um, there are several criteria that are available to assist in determine, determining whether an entity should be defined as part of the system or not. Um, so the first criteria is the developmental control. So you can ask yourself these questions. Um, does the system developer have control of the entity development? Uh, can the developer influence the requirements of the entity or are requirements defined outside the, of the developer's sphere? of influence. Is funding part of the development budget or is it controlled by another organization? So if you if you answer these questions and you say, okay, no, then most likely that component, uh, that entity is not part of your system. So it should be part of the outside boundary or it should be outside the boundary. Operate, operational control. Once filled, will the entity be under the operational control of the organization that controls the system? Will the tasks and missions performed by the entity by that be directed by the owner of the system? Will another organization have operational control at times? Uh, same thing. Functional allocation. In the functional definition of the system, is the system's engineer allowed to allocate functions to the entity? Uh, and then you need in your purpose. Is the entity dedicated to the system's success? Once filled, can the entity be removed without objection, objection by another entity? 
So if you are answering no to these questions, then um, most likely that entity is not part of your system since you don't have control over it. Um, so an important communication tool available to the systems engineer is the context diagram. This effectively displays the external entities and their interactions with the system and instantly allows the reader to identify those external entities. Uh, so external entities are these constitute all entities in which the system will interact. Okay, so you interact with them, but they're not part of your system. Um, so for example, if you're dealing with the system that requires uh, input in terms of data, uh, so you're working with hospitals, for instance. Uh, so you are not, your system might not include the hospitals, but then you, you still have to interact with them in order to get information about patients, for instance. Uh, so those are ent external entities. You, you're sharing information, data, activities. Uh, they're providing you with data and though you're using that information to uh, make decisions or to provide feedback. Um, the context diagram for, for a car, uh, you can see that uh, the car is interacting with a uh, maintainer, the user, the energy source, which could be the gas, the environment. Uh, so the car itself is, is a system, but it is interacting. The, the, the users, for example, are not part of the system. The maintainer is not part of the system. These are entities that are external, and we can define that those as outside of the boundary of the car or the system, which in this case is the car. Um, types of environmental interactions, uh, they are different. Uh, first, the primary interactions represent functional input, outputs, and controls. And secondary interactions are elements that, are, that interact with the system in an indirect non-functional manner, such as physical supports, ambient temperature, and so on. And this picture uh, or figure 3.4 shows uh, the environments of a passenger airliner. Um, so for example, we have the flag environment, the landing environment, the support environment, uh, the people and payload interface and the maintenance environment. Okay, so the last piece of, of this discussion is the interfaces and interactions. Um, interaction between two individual elements of the system are uh, effect, affected through the interface between them. Uh, so for example, interface between a car driver's hand and the steering wheel enables the driver to guide or interact with the car. And transmitter force that turns the steering wheel and thereby the car's wheels. Uh, another example, interface between the tires the, of the car and the road, both propel the car. Uh, this transmit driving traction to the road. So my question for you is what, it, what interfaces, interactions are involved in the brake, pedal and braking? So if you're familiar with the car uh, system, uh, you have a complete uh, system or subsystem that is dedicated for stopping your vehicle. Uh, so there are multiple interfaces, interactions involved in braking. Um, so you have fluids going through the subsystem and then at the end, it, it, it ends in the, in the tires, right? Um, where there's some friction happening between the, the disc and the uh, brake pads. So interactions, functional interactions are affected by physical interactions that flow across physical interfaces. Um, so in this picture, we have some functional interactions and physical interfaces. So the functional interaction, uh, you have control. You have a physical interface that is able to control the aileron deflection uh, for the uh, radio control air vehicle to move up and down. Uh, so that will be the functional interaction. Uh, at the top, we have this in, uh, box diagram in which we have the aileron deflection command. It moves the aileron and then 
you have the deflection. Uh, external system interaction, an important, uh, but sometimes not adequate address, adequately address external system interaction occurs during uh, maintenance. Um, access to vital system function for testing purposes, special test point of the system uh, can be sampled externally. In some complex systems, you incorporate an extensive set of building tests, uh, which can be exercised while your system is in operation. And the design of such interfaces is also the concern of the systems engineer. Uh, so to systemize the identification of external and internal interfaces, we will distinguish uh, three types. First one is the connectors, the second one is the isolator, and the third one are the converters. And in here, in table 2.3, we have examples of interface elements. Uh, again, look, looking at the different types, so connectors, isolators, and converters. And we have examples for electrical, mechanical, hydraulic, and human machine. Uh, so for example, if you look at the human machine interaction uh, medium, the connectors will be the display control panel, the isolator will be the cover window, and the converter will be the keyboard. Okay, so this is the last slide for this lecture. Um, again, this is important lecture in terms of understanding some of the uh, L components um, of the design of the system, uh, functional elements, and, and so on. So, um, so I'm gonna stop here. Uh, make sure that you go through these concepts carefully. And if you have questions, uh, you can contact me. Thanks.